Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you very much everyone for coming. Great turnout on a terribly cold evening, so that's uh, something really encouraging. I think it, it shows uh, the, the level of uh, you know, interest and, and, and expertise I suspect is around in the room, which we can talk about later. Um, my name is Chris Rand. I'm the editor of Queen Edith's Community News, which uh, I hope most of your local residents receive through your doors. Um, uh, there's another one coming out in the week and a bit's time, which is, uh, we've got it all nicely redesigned as a Queen Edith's magazine, so yeah, see what you think of it. I hope you like it. Um, I think we have to do a bit of uh, housekeeping first, don't we? Which is um, fire exits. Yes. Is that right? The fire exits well, in, in the obvious places, there and there and yeah, all that sort of stuff. Um, the toilets at the back, through the back door there, um, and teas, coffees will be served at any time during the evening, but particularly we'll have one break in the middle, that'll be the good time to do it. And there's being a Queen Edith's Community Forum event, uh, there is of course cake, and uh, you're all welcome to it. It's very nice. Um, a couple of things before we start. Um, uh, the Queen of this Community News, um, as you know, is a, is a non-profit magazine and we are always looking for sponsors for it. So if any of you are involved in businesses that might be um, find us useful, just as a sponsorship opportunity, as well as advertising, please do grab me at any time. We need three or four more companies to come in to make sure we can do decent issues quarterly this year. That would be really good if we could do it. We've got a fantastic commitment from some super local businesses, but just need two or three more. So uh, anything from you know, one-man band, tradesmen type things to, to big corporates, anywhere where you can put in a word for us. Uh, or even if you use people yourself who think uh, might benefit from advertising with us. Um, the, uh, just as a, an example, um, the, the uh, chap who cleans my windows advertised with us um, and uh, he said if you got one new customer from it, it would be worth doing the advert. Uh, in the first week he got 42 people ringing. So, <laughs> so it does work. I mean, gardeners, plumbers, electricians, you name it. Um, it's well worth it for them. Um, the other thing we produce uh, regularly is the uh, What's On In Queen Edith's um, email, which comes out weekly. I'm sure lots of you get that. Um, if any of you don't, and you'd like to, there's over on that table on that side, there's a place where you can put your um, email address and be added to the circulation. That's from this week. Um, just as a matter of interest for this evening, not only do we promote this through online, we also um, put a few leaflets through doors. Do, does anybody, did anybody come along because they've got a leaflet through a door tonight? Just their hands? Did anybody no? get a leaflet? Oh, only a few, but uh, we, we just tried it out as an experiment. So, okay, one or two, so that's interesting. Um, so our agenda for tonight um, is uh, on the theme of new housing development. And I'm sure there are several of you here from the very south of the, the area, uh, Wart's Causeway, etc., um, who are affected by new housing and from Nine Wells, of course. Um, you're all welcome and I'm sure it'll be very interesting. Um, we have um, three presentations. Uh, first of all, uh, my colleague Sam Davis here will be looking at the survey which we recently did of the different parts of Queen Edith and what people thought of it. Um, and Sam will explain why we've done that and why it's very relevant for tonight. Um, secondly, um, Sam will then be talking to uh, Risa Sorkin from the uh, Nine Wells Residents Association, uh, who will be talking about what it's like to live in our newest completed um, housing area and some of the problems involved in that. And then finally we'll have, after the break, we'll have Paul Framer from the Local Council's Shared Planning Service. Um, we'll be talking about the next local plan. So two local plans ago we had um, Nine Wells, which has now been built. Last local plan we've got um, the two Wards Causeway developments. Uh, and the next local plan, which is just about to be put together, who knows what we're going to get. But uh, we're very keen uh, that you know, we try and facilitate lots of local input into that because you know, it's not happened in the past and we, we have had problems because of it. So um, we also have um, some representatives here tonight uh, and some literature from the two new developments uh, going in either side of Watts Causeway. And uh, I, I do um, encourage you all to talk to the people concerned. 
and have a look at the leaflets and the plans they've got. I think there's some, some new information tonight that people might not know about, so that should be quite interesting. I'm, I'm, Sam will probably talk about that a bit more in a moment. But uh, maybe I can pass over to you now, Sam, and uh, we can uh, do the bit about the survey. Right, thank you, Chris, and good evening, everybody. I'm Sam Davis. I'm the chair of the Community Forum, and Chris is standing in Word Screen. <laughs> well done. Right. Um, so, yeah, hope, how many people in this room completed the survey, either online or on paper? Brilliant. Okay. So, we had um, 226, 326 responses to the survey uh, for the month and a week or so it was running, which is 5% of the adult population of Queen Edith's. So I think that is a pretty good uh, demonstration of community interest for something that was run by a community group with zero budget. And um, I will now explain what we've learned from it and what we hope to continue to learn from it as we dig into the data more thoroughly. Um, for those of you who, who didn't complete it, um, very briefly, it, it's a survey which is a piece of industry standard software, it's called Place Standard, um, and it enables people to score their level of satisfaction with 14 different characteristics of their local area, and uh, it was open to everybody in Queen Edith's. Uh, we publicised it through the community news, through uh, email, Facebook, Twitter, posters, you name it. We tried to get the word out. The things we like about it are that it uh, enables analysis of the results by age and by sex and critically by geography. So we can drill down results to the level of individual roads if we want to. But what we've done for the purposes of tonight is to group it into four areas, which my beautiful assistant will now demonstrate. So, um, we've given them names. Uh, the blue area in the top left is Rock. The red area is Wolfston. The yellow-orange area is Nightingale. And the green area is Red Cross. And we've, we've grouped those uh, results because we think that those reflect something meaningful about how people perceive their geographies. Obviously it's possible to, to cut the data different ways, but that's what we've gone with. And um, that's how the responses were distributed. So a couple of comments on that really. A small response from Wolfston, which might skew some of the outcomes from that. But um, I think proportionally, in terms of population, a really high response from Red Cross. If you think about the, the housing down there, that's actually, you know, a, a very creditable outcome. And I think says something about how interested people are in place down there, how bothered they are about it. And we can come on to some of the reasons for that later. So this is the headline result for the whole ward. So the, the scoring worked on a scale of one to seven. One was uh, a score which indicated you saw a great deal of need for improvement on a particular criterion. Seven was that you were very happy with it. And I guess one of the really nice things about that is that my interpretation of it is, broadly speaking, people in Queen Edith are relatively happy. So um, that's nice that the average score was 4.4 out of 7 for all areas, all age groups across the whole piece. Um, yes, so sorry, for those, for those who uh, are not as intimately familiar with this piece of work as I am, um, the 14 criteria are starting at 12 o'clock, moving around, public transport, traffic and parking, streets and spaces, natural space, play and recreation, facilities and amenities, six o'clock is work and local economy, and then carrying around housing and community, social contact, identity and belonging, feeling safe, care and maintenance, and influence and sense of control. And the reason we liked this survey as a way of working is because it deals with things that are quite concrete, like public transport, you know, 
is your area well served by buses or not? But also some of the softer stuff, which I think it's easy to overlook. Do people feel safe? Do people feel a sense of identity with the area where they're living? And in many senses, those are just as important as the concrete stuff. So, sort of outliers there, really. People seem to feel safe. That's really important. So that's, that's scored a solid six as a median value. Um, not very surprisingly, the lowest scoring result was for traffic and parking. I can't imagine there's anybody in this room who would be very surprised by that outcome. But really the, the interest is when you start to move down into the next level and look at results by area. So what we've done here is we've kept the, the black spots for the whole neighbourhood results and then we've put on coloured spots for specific areas. So this is rock. This is this end of town. And um, the only return for rock which differed from the median value across the whole neighbourhood was for social contact. People in rock seem to think their ability to maintain social contact is better than across the area as a whole. Wolfston was a bit more interesting. Um, so a very strong response on facilities and amenities and play and recreation. Uh, a very poor response for public transport, feeling safe, identity and belonging, and housing and community. And one of the things I'm not going to go into this evening is all the comments that came back alongside these scores. So there, there are free text boxes, people could, could write what they thought. I'm currently ploughing my way through an amalgamated 100 page document of all of the comments because people in Queenie did seem to like writing. So <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot to go through, but um, comments about population turnover and what that does for community and making it harder to build community, uh, I think were quite evident in some of the Wolfston comments. Um, and it's interesting to me that facilities and amenities scored highly. I assume that's a reference to Wolfston Way in particular and possibly proximity to the schools. We're still looking into that. And Terry Hinton Hall people really liked as well. Um, Sitting alongside the survey, we did a couple of workshops, community workshops on sort of redesign, how people would like to see the Wollstone Way, Community This Way area redesigned as an experiment a couple of weekends ago. There is a really big appetite for serious investment in Wollstone Way to make those shops a proper heart of the neighbourhood. And, you know, the appetite for that's there and the potential for that's there. So that's one of the things that I would like to... Ah, I thought it would be trouble. Um, that's one of the things that we'd really like to push forward with. Okay, the next area is Nightingale. And amazingly, Nightingale people are 100% representative of the area as a whole. Uh, so I'm not sure there's much more value I can add to that. But this is where it gets really interesting. So this is Red Cross. People in Red Cross are not happy compared with the area as a whole. So of the 14 criteria, they were below the average on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and on some of those, significantly below. If you look at facilities and amenities, the average score for Red Cross was two compared with five as the rest of the world. And this is one of the things that we know is an issue. And we'll come on to this when we, when Risa and I talk about Nine Wells. The south of the area is appallingly badly provided for. People who bought on Nine Wells were told that their nearest uh, retail outlet that they should go to buy their paper or their pint of milk was the ho hospital concourse, Marks and Spencers. And you can see what people think of that. That is not a practical outcome. So. Having got that set of results, we then wanted to drill down even further. So we separated what we'd called Red Cross out 
into two groups. So we took the nine worlds data and we separated it out from what I will apologise for calling the rump of Red Cross. So Babraham Road, Greenlands, Red Cross Lane and so on. And actually there are marked differences even within that geography. And again, the, the rump of Red Cross is returning lower schools, you know, pretty much across the board there. And um, it saddened me, it really saddens me that there's, there's part of the ward where people are feeling like there is that much wrong with their neighbourhood. And so one of the things that I'm now getting going is trying to support some residents who are setting up a residence association there so they can actually take some of this forward as a collective and try and address some of the problems that they have. And in terms of, in terms of next steps, so talked about the Red Cross area RA. In a minute, I'm going to talk to Risa, who's one of the chairs of the Nine Wells Residents Association, about the lessons learned from Nine Wells. To me, it seems obvious that if Queen Edith is going to host further urban fringe sites, GB1, GB2, and whatever might come as a result of the next local plan, we really have to be taking on board the learning from the sites that we've already built. And there is learning, and what we need is people to listen to what is coming out of those. Um, we want to carry on the work, as I said, going through these hundred pages of comments and really looking for the things that people value and want to preserve and the things that people want addressed and make sure that we are making progress with those. This survey, we can run this every year. This now gives us a benchmark and we can see if people are getting happier or less happy with what's going on in the area in future and I, I think the value of that is significant. And hopefully this will give us an engine for building some community engagement. I mean, the fact that this room full of people has turned out tonight to come along and listen to this says something to me about how involved people want to be in the future of this area. And we can look for some quick wins and some bigger projects and plan how we're going to, to move the place on. And before I come to any questions, I just want to reference a couple of props I brought along with me. So in the centre of uh, the December of Queen Edith's Community News, we did this map showing development projects and transport projects that are uh, relevant to our area and likely to be coming forward in the next few years. And I think a lot of people look at this kind of uh, impact on their day-to-day -day living and worry about what's coming and the process of delivering this is painful. We found out today that Fenden Ray Roundabout is going to overrun by another three months. Sorry if I'm breaking bad news to people in the room. Um, you know, so on the one hand there is just, it just feels like there's an endless list of projects to accommodate and work around. But on the other hand, I went to Joy's Garden today, which is the little community garden we've set up as a meanwhile project on Bulldog Way. And someone had left me a hellebore. And it just says a donation for Joy's Garden. People do care. People want this place to work. So let's build on that energy and positivity and enthusiasm and think more about hellebores and less about roundabouts. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Before we do any questions, and I'm sure there are, there are some, um, if any of you want, uh, didn't see the map, didn't get the issue um, that we did for Christmas of Queen Edith's community news and didn't see the map, there are some copies uh, by the front door, or if, you didn't, you know, if you've lost yours and wish you had looked at it properly, <laughs> then, uh, there are a few left, so that's fine. Um, if I could kick off the questions, Sam, rudely uh, interrupting, um, uh, just to ask, why have you done this? I mean, I know this is an interest of yours, uh, this community stuff, but I mean, you know, none of us, including yourself, I'm sure, are, are experts, nor, are we, nor do we have any power to do things. So, so what's behind, um, you know, what you personally have done here in terms of doing the survey? 
Um, well, I, I don't have a huge amount of professional knowledge, but I am trying to build it. I'm, I'm halfway through a, a master's in urbanism at UCL, and the reason I'm doing that, and the reason I do all of this stuff, is because I want to understand how places work and how they can work better. And the reason for doing this survey now is it just feels like it's such a pregnant time. Um, we've got Cambridge South Station, which appears to be hoving into view, bringing some potential problems with it, as well as the, the benefits. We have consultations running one after the other. There's, there is so much change happening around us, and the growth of the campus is going to have such a bearing on all of our lives in the next few years. And I, I think it's really important that residents get their voices heard and are equal players in this. And one of the ways we can do that is by having what I would argue now is an evidence base to start a discussion. Yeah, I, I thoroughly agree. And from what I've seen, a lot of the consultations we get asked to uh, take part in by um, councils and by developers and things are, are very well-meaning, but. Um, they're often too late. You know, things are already happening, and they're, they're almost getting our opinions on you know something that they've, that's already been decided. And I think the idea of trying to build an evidence base of what we've already got here, so before any consultations come from the authorities and from developers, we've got stuff to show them, um, could be a big help, maybe in, in guiding this, and you know, maybe in getting something going, which would be better. So, do we have any questions for Sam on this? David. Sam, you said you could break, break it down by age. Yes. I wonder what perspective you've collected from younger people, however, however younger is defined. Um, so there is uh, a whole kind of slide pack sitting underneath this of incredibly detailed information, which I, I should give a shout out to Chris Wallace, who's sitting at the back pretending she's invisible. She's done all of the statistical work on this to make sure that I'm not just hypothesizing, the evidence actually backs up what I'm saying. Um, younger people are less happy in Queen Edith's, and by younger I don't just mean kind of under 16s, uh, all the way through to sort of the 24 to 35 age group, they are less happy. And again, I think when we're thinking about how we can use this information, part of it feeds into a planning uh, brief, but part of it should be about looking at what other city council services come into the area and trying to ensure that it tackles some of those issues. And we need to understand why those younger people are feeling so disconnected and, and so dissatisfied. I, I have lots of charts I can show you, but I won't do it now if that's all right. Um, they will be um, published online and we'll try and put some copies, certainly in the library. Um, if and anywhere else that people have ideas might be useful to, yep. for us to leave it, we'll, we'll do a full report where people can have a look, yeah? Yep. And the, that'll be referenced also in the new Queen of this magazine in a couple of weeks' time, so you'll be able to get a link from there to see where everything is. Linda. Um, are there any significant uh, differences around gender Yeah, um, well, Chris will tell me, but she's shaking her head. I, that didn't come out. So we had slightly more female responses back than male, 57% females. Um, but in her um, detailed statistical analysis, which went way over my head, I don't believe anything came out that was particularly significant about gender. Okay. 